recently, we have experienced some staff changes up here at the church, and those haven't affected me too greatly, except for the fact that there's a weekly email that I send, and since I work at both of our campuses, I send this to two different supervisor level people at each campus, and those two people have recently changed. And so, uh, though I have been doing this weekly report for years, they are new to receiving it from me. And one of the ways that I've always done it, I just sit down, it takes me about 30 minutes, and I uh, put all the areas of ministry that are underneath me, and then I just bullet point a few highlights from each of those areas for that week. And so it tends to be a kind of long email, but I just wanna make sure that I can remember everything and all the contacts that were made and the progress and keep them informed of what's going on in men women's ministry. Well, this past week after uh, my supervisor at the North Campus recently got his first weekly update from me, he pulled me aside and said, hey, I just want you to know that I don't know if that is what the person before me required of you, but I don't need that much detail. In fact, if you'll just send me the top five things that you do every week, that will be fine. Just the top five, the most important things. Well, listen, as I was getting ready for our last week together in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, it seems like someone might have pulled the Apostle Paul aside and told him something similar. We are going to see that in this last chapter, he is going to really highlight kind of the top five things, recapping what he has told them throughout both of these epistles. And so we are going to get to that shortly, but let's just re recap as we come in into our conclusion with the Thessalonian church. So we have seen two primary things that have been going on in these epistles. One of them, and we talked about this extensively, especially in the first epistle, was living in light of eternity. We see that Paul is constantly pushing the Thessalonian church to live in light of eternity. There's something coming. That's why we have dealt so much with eschatology in these epistles. So he's talking to them about living with the future in mind, living in light of eternity. The second thing that we've seen is that there seems to be some waiting. Both of these epistles, we see the church is kind of waiting on what that will look like. And so he is actively encouraging them that waiting is not idle, idleness. They need to be working towards sanctification, towards unity, towards building the church and advancing the kingdom. And so we see many charging orders in this period of wait. And so here we find ourselves in this last last uh, little bit of the epistle where he is going to conclude and really admonish them on the top five things. But let's just back up, start at the beginning and hear what he has to say. Read with me beginning at verse one. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing and will do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. Now, one of the things that always strikes me about Paul's writing is he's very simple and straightforward on paper, and yet he's still very deep doctrinally and theologically. I like that about him. So he tells them, of course, to pray. Pray for us because Paul is always very clear that it is the Lord that is doing the work in the church, okay? It is not something they have mustered up. It is not something that because of who they are, they have done so well with. It is because they have surrendered to the Lordship in their lives and in their body of believers that he is advancing them and doing something and allowing this work to take root. So he says, continue to pray, pray for us. And then he says that the Lord may speed ahead and be honored. And so that's very much a biblical concept about the Lord going before us. It's talking about the advancement 
of the kingdom. And so again, very plain language, but very deep meaning. And of course, it's also uh, indicative of what we learned in the very first week, the very first uh, uh, introduction to the first epistle, which is how Paul was very strategic in planting this church in Macedonia. And so what he's saying is this has been, God has blessed these efforts. There is a strategy here. There is a big, uh, there is a big measure of influence that could happen from this region. And so he's praying that the Lord would be honored and this would continue, this work would continue to advance. And then Paul asks them to pray for the deliverance from evil. And we've talked about this a lot. There is an enemy of the gospel. There is an enemy. And Paul faces this enemy time and time again. As you well know, the gospel in the early church advances and flourishes from prison cells. Paul is constantly under attack. He is being chased after, sought after from enemies of the gospel. So he's asking them to pray for him because there's evil people that seek him and seek to destroy the kingdom. And so, but he quickly follows that up, not pr a prayer of desperation, not a prayer because he feels like this is uh, ill-fated, a prayer of belief because he follows that right up with, but the Lord is faithful. So he's encouraging them to pray for him with the knowledge that God is faithful, God is enough. And so I love that perspective that we see Paul offer there. And then without skipping a beat, he says, we have confidence in the Lord about you, that you are doing and will do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. Paul doesn't leave his post as pastor for very long. He, he shows some vulnerability there. He asks for them to pray. He admonishes them. And then he quickly returns to his role of pastor, giving them confidence in their faith, um, asking them to rest in the steadfastness of God. You know, steadfastness is just, uh, is really the basis for our sanctification. When we can rest in the steadfastness of the Lord, the unwavering, dutiful support, the, uh, the rock that is Christ, then we have a firm foundation from which to build our relationship with the Lord. And so this is, this is a big deal. Abiding in the steadfastness of Christ is key to our sanctification. And of course, sanctification has been covered a lot in these epistles because it is, because it is what we are called to do in the period of waiting. And I want to remind you, we are still in the period of waiting, okay? We are still waiting for the return of Christ. So this is applicable to us in very similar way that it was applicable to the early church, okay? So we need to rest in that steadfastness, the unequivocal assurance that God is faithful faithful, the steadfastness of Christ. Let's continue on beginning in verse six. Now we command you brothers in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the traditions that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor, we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. We've, we've called this study imitators and imposters. And you see Paul explaining the meaning of that right here again in the conclusion. Verse 10. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now, such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him 
as a brother. Now, I'm not sure if you've picked up on the tone of this, but what we really see is that Paul is passing the baton to the leadership of the Thessalonian church, okay? He is probably unsure when he will get to see them again, if he will hear another report, if he will have an opportunity to write to them again. He, he, is, he is passing the baton because he may not know exactly what the future holds for him in relation but he wants this church to continue. He is not saying, uh, you know, y'all have done well and it was fun. He's saying, no, here are my last instructions and you guys keep running. You guys keep doing what you have been called to do. Here's some admonishment on how to do that, okay? And this is where we see those five important things show up. And of course, they're probably familiar to you because they're very reminiscent of things he has said before. In fact, one commentator I read described this passage as really one of our essential passages on establishing the church and the policy of church discipline. Now, obviously, there's other places in Scripture, for instance, Matthew, where this is dealt with. But what we see is he is really giving them some important instructions to go forth as a body of believers as the church okay now here's where we come to our top five i'm going to give them to you up front and then we'll, then we'll unpack them the first one is don't be lazy the second don't be a burden three don't be weary four don't be negligent and five don't be forgetful now quickly i want to point out something to you None of these top five things that Paul is leaving the Thessalonian church with deal with end times. They don't deal with the kingdom calendar. They don't deal with the birth pains or the markers. They don't deal with the rapture or the second coming. These are not the things he focuses on when he is leaving them with their final instructions. And here's why that's important. Because if we are to understand how the early church, the original hearers of this word would have received it, then we have to understand that they would not have received it in the context of trying to figure out a timeline. They would have received it in the context of looking towards eternity as a body of believers. And so we also have to receive the message in that same vein. We've talked about this a lot. It's exegesis versus hermeneutics. So we cannot take a primary meaning from something that was secondary or tertiary in these letters. That does not mean that if you have a particular interest in eschatology or end time studies that you can't spend extra time on that. That is perfectly fine, but we have to understand that that was not the primary message of this epistle. The primary message of this epistle was to strengthen the church, to establish the church, that they may go out and continue to advance the kingdom of God in that region, okay? So I want us to always keep that in mind. And the reason why is because they were under persecution. They needed things that were going to sustain them and keep the enemy at bay so that they may flourish, okay? And a timeline wasn't going to do that right? That's, it's Christ and our relationship and our sanctification in this time of waiting that is going to give us that encouragement and those tools in our belt, okay? Because we want to wait well just like this church did. Okay, so let's briefly unpack these five admonitions. The first one is don't be lazy. Now, this may seem familiar to you. I want you to know that as, as I read this, when I was getting ready, I panicked and said, did I accidentally teach the wrong passage one week? Because this was so familiar from back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, thankfully, I did not. But what we see is that this is something he's already touched on idleness, okay? And what we see happening here is that we talked about that doctrine of eminence. We see that the Thessalonian church very much knows that Christ's return, whether it's the rapture, the second coming, whatever your views there are on that, that it is imminent. Now, the problem is that imminent does not equal soon. Imminent 
equals eventual. It, it is going to happen. We understand that it is coming. And so what happened was some in the church while waiting, decided to just push aside these uh, admonitions towards sanctification, and they were just kind of waiting, twiddling their thumbs, okay, that I'm just going to be idle in this time because it's not going to be long till Christ returns, and so then I'm good. And what he's saying is, that's lazy. That's lazy. You are not called to be idle. That is not a good witness. That is not how you imitate us. That is not the example that Paul set for them when he was there. Mark Howell cautions, avoid the temptation to move past these words too quickly. There exists today an unhealthy sense of entitlement among many who claim to be called to serve as ministers in God's church, okay? This is a problem within the church at that time and even now, which is that we sometimes get lazy in the work that we have been called to do in toiling towards the kingdom while we wait, while we are here. Yes, we know Christ is coming back. Yes, we know eternity awaits. Yes, we live in light of that, but we do, do so working hard that many might come to know God, that many might be saved. And we do so also as to not, uh, as to not relinquish the value that God has in work, okay? You know, there's something that is important that we can't miss here. God has all of the resources available. If he wanted us to be completely idle, he could have taken care of us. In fact, in Matthew 6, 26, it says, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? What this tells us is that God could easily take care of our needs without us ever lifting a finger. But what Paul is telling this church and what this is telling us in turn is that that is not how God established us to live. In fact, it says right here in scripture that if we do not work, we do not eat. So our provision is contingent upon the way God has established that pr provision to be uh, provided for, and that is through work, not laziness, okay? So we honor God, we respect the process of provision that he has established himself by not being idle, not being lazy, okay? The second thing we're told is don't be a burden. Now, this is not the first time, once again, that we see him caution this. And it's no accident that it follows right after not being lazy and not being idle. Because what happens is when uh, idleness and laziness invades the body, what happens is there's few people working and they become, the others that are idle become burdensome, okay? They become burdensome. I can tell you this firsthand. I am uh, the women's director here at Prestonwood and we have two campuses and I serve both campuses. And let me tell you something, there is not any possible way that I could take care of the needs of all of our women if it were not for the fact that others come alongside of me and teach, others come alongside of me and serve and counsel and disciple and mentor and all of the things. Because if they did not do that, if they did not take that seriously, their role as believers, their role as followers of Christ, as part of this body of believers at our church, I would be crushed from the burden of it all. I could not do it. And that's exactly what we see Paul telling them is, listen, you cannot leave all the work up to just two or three people. You cannot do that. Do not be a burden because that is what happens when laziness invades a believer's life, okay? The third thing we see here is do not be weary. Now this makes me laugh. I was just telling my friend Jared who is in here filming with me that I've had a particularly stressful week. It's just 
just been crazy. There's been a lot of things personally going on with me. I've been very busy, um, just meeting after meeting after meeting. And I, when I came to do not be weary, I thought to myself like, well, yeah, I wish I wasn't. I mean, wouldn't it be nice if we could just not be weary, if I could walk in the door after a long day's work and picking up kids from school and taking them to lessons and going to Bible study, if I could walk in at nine o'clock that night and my husband could say, don't be weary. And I'd be like, you know what? You're right. I'm fine. Let's do something fun. That's not how it works, right? So we have to, of course, take this in context. And so what is Paul saying? Is he telling them, don't be tired? That's not godly? No. What he's saying is, do not be weary in doing good, okay? The Enduring Word commentary says, this was a proper encouragement for those who were working as they should. Few things were more wearying than seeing others take advantage of Christian generosity. But we should never let the manipulations of some discourage us from doing good to the truly needy. And so what he is saying is, Obviously, there are some among them who have been lazy, who have been burdensome, and there are others that are toiling and are doing the things they're called to do, and it's tiresome. But what he's saying is don't let that distraction of the others who are perhaps not pulling their own weight uh, make you not want to continue to do the good that you've been called to do because there's truly people in need, okay? So you don't want to, I mean, I think another way that we could say this maybe in modern English would be don't be, don't be cynical about the work God's called you to do. Don't, don't get the idea that, well, what does it really matter? So-and-so never does it and they're doing just fine. Um, there's, there's an there's a propensity that we have to look to the left or to the right and see what others are doing and then kind of assess our situation in light of that. And so Paul's telling them, don't grow weary in what you've been called to do. Don't grow weary in doing good because there are people in need and you are doing the work of the Lord. So don't grow weary. The fourth one is don't be negligent. Okay, Paul confronts this head on. He says, if anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, then have nothing to do with them. Now, again, I want you to remember context, okay? And he is talking to the believers, to the church. There are a lot of people in this world that do not live as God commands them. And we are not to form a holy huddle and keep them away because of this passage right here in scripture. No, this is talking about how, this, this is church discipline. This is talking about a body of believers who have committed to follow and, uh, and jointly and corporately follow after Christ as well as individually, everyone doing their part, submitting to the leadership that has been set, listening to the prophetic word, so many of the things that we've dealt with throughout here and it's saying that when someone does not obey that, when they are negligent to do that, then you are going to, you are going to put them on the outside for a little bit. But the point of it is so that they might be restored eventually. The, what you want them to do is to miss this fellowship, to understand that there is a void created by their sin. Because see, see negligent sounds uh, kind of like a fancy word, but really what this is, negligence is sin. It's sin. That's what it is. That's what the root of this is. And so he's telling them, listen, when you've got believers among you who are actively engaging in sin, you disassociate with them. And then, of course, we see at other places in Scripture that there are, uh, there are processes that we are to employ about going to them and confronting them privately. And so what we have to see here is this is being established as a brotherly accountability within the church that is designed to hopefully uh, point them back into fellowship, uh, renouncing the sin that they are engaged in and coming back into the fold, okay? So this is something that is restorative and redemptive in nature, not judgmental, judgmental and punitive per se, okay? And so we want to understand that they are not the enemy. They are to be treated as a brother or a sister, okay? So don't be negligent. And then the last one is don't be forgetful. 
forgetful. Don't be forgetful. Uh, my sister is, uh, I, I think she wouldn't mind me telling you this, she forgets so many things and she always says, you can't talk yourself out of that. Sometimes you just don't remember things. Now, interestingly, Paul does not overtly say anything about forgetfulness, but what we see in the entire tone of this last chapter is he is reminding them. He is reminding them, okay? You can't control if something slips from your head, but what he is telling them is, put this in front of you. Have every one of you need to be listening to this. The body needs to receive these admonitions because if you don't live this way, if you don't conduct your church this way, you are going to shrivel up and die because there is an enemy from outside firing darts at you, okay? There are imposters encircling this body of believers in Macedonia, this, this Thessalonian church. And so he is telling them uh, for just in an implied way, you can't forget this. You might remember that even last week we talked about how forgetfulness, their forgetfulness of all the things that Paul had taught them and showed them had led to their fretfulness. Okay, that there was chaos, this atmosphere of we are, we are concerned, we are worried we've missed the rapture. There was just so much, we, we've had imposters writing letters and so they were being actively deceived. And so Paul is once again in a, uh, in a subtle way reminding them you can't forget this. Read it to the assembly, let everyone know, all of you get on the same page here because if you forget these teachings, if you forget how we have set up the example for you and ask you to imitate, then you are going to be in trouble. And that is the same for us. And so what do we do if we're not going to forget something, okay? Because my sister's right. We can't decide what slips in and out of our head. But that means we can continually be in God's word so that we don't forget. We safeguard against our humanity. That's what we do. We recognize that we do have a propensity to forget. We do have a propensity to move away from the things that we've been taught. So we have to safeguard against that. We have to keep God's words continually on our lips. We have to uh, be in a fellowship of believers. We don't forsake the gathering together of others. We live in community and accountability with one another so that forgetfulness does not happen, okay? Let's finish up and start with me in verse 16. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. This is the sign of genuineness in every letter of mine. It is the way I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Now, this is a very typical conclusion to one of Paul's epistles. He often and almost always encourages, uh, includes two elements, grace and peace grace and peace. He knows that. Now, it's of course not coincidental that he refers to the Lord of peace, okay? So once again, letting the church know that peace does not happen apart from the Lord. So he is encouraging them once again towards relationship with God, towards following after God, towards living in a kingdom manner, because that is who is going to govern with peace. Peace does not happen apart from God. And then, of course, grace. And, um, and he, that is the essential quality of the gospel, is the grace that God gives us. And so grace and peace are what he is leaving with them in these final moments. Now, one thing you might find interesting is how Paul uh, writes in these last couple of lines about writing it himself. Back during that time period, it would have been very typical to have a scribe that you would have given your letter to and they would have written it out. But then often you would find that the author would write the last couple of lines in his handwriting for authenticity. Now, it's especially important in this epistle because we know of at least one time when an imposter has sought to uh, mislead them with a fake letter, okay? So we see that it really takes some importance here when he says this because uh, he, they now know this is a verified letter of Paul because they have been actively deceived, but here is how they will authenticate that. And then the last thing 
that uh, I saw that scholars and commentators pointed out, and I thought this was interesting, is in the conclusion of verse 18. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Now, Paul doesn't always use the word all when he's ending correspondence, okay? In fact, in the, um, in the first epistle, we don't see that there. So we can surmise that Paul is actually including that word all so that they understand that though he is calling out some people who have engaged in laziness, who have been burdens, who have perhaps forsaken and been negligent toward the commands of God, he is still speaking to them. So again, that's one way that we understand that it is not that he is ostracizing sinners, people that are actively engaged in negligence, it is that he is letting them know this is how you come back into fellowship. So he is writing this letter for all of the believers, not just the ones that would appear to be in good standing. Charles A. Wanamaker in the book that he wrote on the Thessalonians says, if any theological point is to be made for the inclusion of the word all, it is perhaps Perhaps that Paul asked for Christ's grace even on those who were not holding to the Christian pattern of behavior regarding work. Okay, so we see that this message in the original uh, going forth of it would have been for everyone. Okay, and so we can see if you feel convicted by anything that Paul has admonished the church about today, what we see is that there is grace and peace for you as well, for me as well. Ladies, do you need peace? Do you need grace? I know I do. I see so many similarities between the culture and the climate of the Thessalonian church and now. Now we are obviously not under the type of dangerous and violent persecution that they would have been, but the uh, chaos, the unrest, the uh, overt attacks from the enemy. Evil is very blatant these days around us and it's different context, but there is just a, a cord of discord that, that seems to be sown around us lately. And I just wanna tell you that Paul's words of encouragement to the church in Thessalonica are ours today. We have a savior who is coming back. There is a doctrine of eminence for us. We have a hope in our future. Eternity does await us, but there is some hard work to be done in the meantime. And that's okay because that's God's plan for us. When we are living according to the will of God, we are going to be blessed. We are going to live in peace. We are going to be rooted in the steadfast love of Christ. And that is going to be the safest, most peaceful, most secure place that we as women can be. So as we conclude today, as we say goodbye to the Thessalonian church and to the epistles of First and Second Thessalonians, let me encourage you not to say goodbye to scripture. Let this not be the last time you open your Bible and study uh, for several weeks. This is something we have got to cling to during times like this because the God of peace and grace is waiting with open arms, with words that are fresh and new for us in the pages of scripture. And we do our best to love and serve him when we stay active and engaged in his word and his body of believers. So as we say goodbye, until next time, study hard, dig deep. It is worth it.